now on the Parents' Journal, helping middle school kids get along. Our guest today is Naomi Drew. She consults with school districts and leads workshops across the country on conflict resolution and peacemaking. Naomi is the author of a book that's called The Kid's Guide to Working Out Conflicts. Naomi, what can parents actually teach their middle school kids in particular in the way of skills that might help them get along with other kids? That's a great question, Bobby, because middle school is the time when conflict peaks. So we want our kids to be equipped to handle whatever comes up among friends, peers, and others. And the first thing that kids need to know how to do is to be a good listener. So many conflicts arise because one person doesn't feel listened to, cared about by the other. So just fostering that in the home by modeling it, teaching it to your children, reinforcing it when they're doing it well, that's going to help them get a great head start. Uh, The other thing is to be empathetic toward others, to try to understand not only your own feelings, because we all know middle schoolers tend to be a little self-centered, so we want them to be focused on the feelings of others as well. That'll help them deflect a lot of conflict and uh, get along with anybody who crosses their path. Another underrated quality that we would like to see a lot more of is kindness. Uh, Kids will gravitate toward other kids who are kind people. So if we can foster that, model it in the home, uh, our kids will definitely have a head start. Now let's talk a bit more about kindness. It seems like a lot of people say we are in a mean culture right now, certainly if you pay attention to the media. There's a lot of mean reality shows and and put-downs and all that kind of stuff. But what can we do as parents, uh, whether we're talking middle school or even younger kids or older kids, to truly set things up where we value kindness? You know, Bobby, I'm so glad you are bringing this up because this is one of my new missions is fostering kindness and, and really making a plea everywhere I go, every workshop I lead, to put that at the top of your list. So how do we foster that in our kids? First of all, we have to model it. Our greatest challenge in modeling kindness sometimes is when we're angry or irritable. Uh, I know I find that personally. Like if I'm a little out of sorts, it's easier to be short-tempered with somebody else. So we have to practice our own calming strategies and manage our own life so that we can model kindness even when life gets challenging because the truth is life gets challenging a lot these days don't you think yeah it sure does and the kids are watching us and how does mom react or how does dad react when somebody cuts them off in traffic and all kinds of things that really can push your buttons yes yes and when we see our kids being unkind we need to name it we need to call them on it we cannot enable this kind of behavior to go on the unkind behavior by um, excusing it like, oh, he just had a bad day. Well, guess what? We're all going to have a lot of bad days in our lives, and we have to still choose to be kind. That doesn't mean blanketing over your true feelings and putting a fake smile on your face. But what it does mean is noticing how you're feeling in the moment and choosing to be respectful and decent to the other person anyway. Now, when you say name it, Naomi, let, let's say you got a middle school kid and they just did something really mean. I mean, are you going to give a lecture? Or no. Are you just going to say that's no. mean? Or what are you going to do? Yeah, lecturing, we know with middle schoolers, actually any age, lecturing doesn't work. But to just quickly say, hey, that was unkind. And then move along? And then move along. Or you could say, um, did you notice that that was kind of mean to him? So to put the question to them, and if they're going to be a little fresh and say, I don't care, then you name how you felt when you saw it. So you say, well, I found it very upsetting to see that action. You know, I I was disappointed, quite frankly. And to just name it yourself, even if they won't, because our words do get in. You know, when they're middle schoolers, and I know I raised two sons, and uh, when they're middle schoolers, they act as if often our words don't mean anything or we're not so smart anymore but the truth is they really are impacted by how we feel and what we say and most 
primarily what we do. So keep giving those messages, even if they're acting like they could care less. We give those messages even more, but not in a lecture. I want to back up a minute. You mentioned calming skills. That seems like such an important area of the conversation that I want to find out more about. What can we do? We're the parents, and we've got middle schoolers in the family. What can we do to teach some kind of skills to help them calm down when they get super frustrated or they're upset or something and they're about to blow their top? First thing we want to do, it's not a skill, but it's a life change. And that first thing is to unstructure just a little bit because kids are so structured and so are we. And when they are on these constantly busy schedules, that alone is going to make them tense. So if we can somehow build into our life and theirs a little bit of unstructured time, free time to just breathe, that's going to help right there. And that will prevent some of these, uh, you know, breakdowns or or meltdowns, I should say. Yes, it will take the pressure off a little bit. So that's critical. Next thing is to teach them a couple of skills that they can use for the rest of their lives. And the one that I teach in every single workshop to every single age group is deep abdominal breathing, which is a lot different than, you know, take a deep breath. That tends not to work. But when we can teach them to breathe all the way down as though it's going into the lower abdomen, holding that breath in for a few seconds and letting it circulate, then slowly exhale, exhale, exhale. So the exhalation is longer than the inhalation. We have to show them how to do it because it doesn't come naturally at first. What does that do in the heat of the moment? Well, there's a whole brain function that changes through this. So what it does is it it calms the body and then it helps to reconfigure the neural pathways. So when we are faced with tremendous stress or conflict or anger, we go into that reptilian brain right in the back and we get stuck there. By doing this kind of breathing and practicing it, we can bring ourselves to another part of the brain, uh, the front of the brain, the neocortex, which is the place of rational judgment. So we can avoid those moments of explosive behavior by doing this process. The other thing is that it reduces the stress hormone, cortisol. So when we're in that um, inflammatory place inside of ourselves, be it triggered by stress, anger, fear, or upset. Regardless, we have that uh, infusion of of a number of hormones in the brain that make us feel worse. So the cortisol is one of them. When we do that breathing, what it does is it reduces that stress hormone, and then our body goes back into balance. If you've just tuned in, we're talking with Naomi Drew. She consults with school districts and leads workshops throughout the country on conflict resolution and peacemaking. She is the author of a book that's called The Kid's Guide to Working Out Conflicts. And, you know, some people listening might think, oh, that breathing stuff, how could that work? But really, when you get it uh, fine-tuned where it becomes a skill that you just sort of, the kids can sort of use when something tense crops up, it can really make a, a almost like a turning point in terms of deciding to do and react in a different way. Exactly. I can give you a quick example. A young man that I worked with who, uh, you know, a preteen who had real anger issues, very explosive kid. Uh, we would do this every single session. We would start with this deep breathing. Then the minute I would see him starting to react to another a child in the group, I would kind of whisper in his ear, okay, now take some of those deep breaths. And I would always say, you can do it invisibly. They don't even know, they don't even have to know you're doing it. So I would notice him starting to get in the habit of doing this breathing. And by the end of the year, when the sessions had ended, he said, this was one of the keys that helped him gain greater control over his explosive anger. And the great thing about that, Naomi, is once a kid like that or any kid gets this tool, they feel more in control. In other words, they don't have to blow up. They have some way to kind of move through that problem area without really losing it. And then they feel really confident. Well, it improves their confidence and their self-esteem because no kid likes to be out of control. This is a myth that we sometimes think, oh, well, they, they want to get out of control because then they're proving their point. The truth is any kid who completely loses it, has a meltdown, 
afterwards they usually feel guilty they feel ashamed and they don't like themselves for it so we're giving them a tool that actually builds their self-esteem as well as their self-control